Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with embodiment specialists from around the world. I'm your host, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Dave Warman. So Dave comes from pretty eclectic background, martial arts, yoga, uh, body work, academic stuff. So um, yeah, I'm going to let Dave tell us his story. So Dave, welcome. Thanks, Mark. So I guess besides when I was younger, various kind of looking at the world and wondering why people were were working jobs, uh, they hated to buy shit they don't need as kind of a paraphrase of that Fight Club quote, which was also a very nice film when I was young. Um, I entered university straight after high school, as you do in my hometown of Camp. And I studied the degree that everyone studies when they don't know what they're going to do with their life, which is science arts. Kind of makes sense. But at that time as well, I had just got into strength training, weight training, and that was something that was useful to me. And I'd always had a love of martial arts. Briefly, when you grow up, I I think a lot of people get this, this thing, but I'd never really explored them in actuality i'd liked martial arts but i hadn't really trained them so i made some type of a vow to myself it's like i'll study this degree i i don't know how much i'll like i'm interested in people i'm interested in life so i'll study it from these perspectives but i want to i want to do some training and so i decided to start uh studying martial arts and i began in the first semester of my uni and it was actually i got my degree uh eventually in science, but it was actually the martial arts training that was the most impactful. I I stumbled upon a very good teacher who was my first teacher. Um, And he taught martial arts, but he also taught about about life, about uh, human transformation, even though he wouldn't always put it like that. He He was mainly teaching martial arts, but because he had a background in psychology and he had done a lot of, uh, a lot of different types of works and he's a very intelligent guy and I'm still in contact with him and I have a great respect for him. He was a perfect fit for the 18 year old Dave uh, who wanted to, to start looking into things. So I did martial arts training for about seven years quite intensively and it became my life. And then I was also on the side looking into the Western physical cultivation methods that were popular at the time, which in 2001, 2006 was kettlebells, uh, what what underground and starting to come up and I got in on the underground and it was this nice cool kind of flavor of yeah like we have this strange training apparatus that no one understands yet and I had one of the first ones in my hometown and people look at it and go is that a cannonball with a handle what is that what <laughs> yeah and now you can now you can get them in Kmart and everywhere it's a funny progression to watch um so I did that and somewhere along the line like I just got into it for the most basic reasons. I like martial arts. You want to become better at fighting. It's better like in shape. They're not the most high minded goals, but they're also not the worst thing for an 18 year old. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a young guy. That's fairly, uh, I have similar story, you know, I wanted to learn to fight or you want to get fit. And that's, that's a fair place to start. It makes sense. And it was all I could handle at the stage. But like I said, I stumbled upon quite a, a very, uh, interesting character to teach me and I, I did some research and this guy out of all the guys I researched he had something different I was like okay like and he had done study with Dan and Asanto and I like Bruce Lee so a lot of the leads kicked in there started doing training and then somewhere along the line of of working with my body intensely multiple times per week I realized that not only had my my body changed so that that's cool but a lot of other things like there was a there was a, a total transformation. I was very indecisive and now I wasn't. I was very introverted. I didn't like speaking in public and now I wasn't. Now you're on a fucking podcast, Dave. <laughs> now I'm on a podcast and it's fine. But at that stage, I still wasn't completely comfortable with it, but I wouldn't die if I had to do it. So that was a big progression for someone. So that happened. Uh, seven years in, I had a weird thing. I started stretching. I started learning stretching at the end of my martial arts career. And I got into stretching, not for the reasons I do now, but I got into it mainly to see if it would improve punching and kicking power. Again, not, not the highest goal perhaps, but okay. Sure. So that, like, and I had to get some convincing from this. My, my martial arts teacher's partner was a teacher of this method by this strange guy called Kit. 
who I'd heard of but didn't think too much about. Like I knew of him. I didn't care too much about it. I was in the martial arts realm. Stretching is over here. Body work, I don't want to know about that. And then I started stretching and it was, it was cool. Like it's interesting. And then I had, I had a few strange experiences because around about that time, the memory, the, there was still this kind of perspective within the realms I studied that the adult body was not changeable, as in flexibility patterns in an adult were kind of set. You couldn't really make huge inroads into them. And then I, I met Kit and we got along really well and I just started kind of following him around and became his apprentice by, by some weird uh, osmosis. But he, he was just like, bullshit, that's bullshit. You can change it. Like it's hard work, but you can change it. And I had a few experiences. One I've, wrote, I've written about a bit. I was in a very deep hip flexor stretch. And, and Kit, as soon as he saw me, was because I argued with him. Not many people would argue with Kit. And I yeah. was just... So Kit who? I, his name's Kit Lachlan. He's famous in the stretching circles for mm-hmm. his method of stretching, which is called stretch therapy. He happened to live in Canberra, my hometown. He happened to go to my university, which was the ANU. So I ran into him and started studying with him and became his guinea pig. And I was in a hip flexor stretch about a year into stretching. And I, I ran up into a, like a, it was a strong stretch, but it was also like a, a metaphysical block. I ran up into the, the concepts I had about the adult body being unchangeable and the reality that you could change them. And so I had a very big stretch. It's very strong, intense. The experience was like, it felt in my body at the time, like the muscle might snap off. It was very strong. And Kit was very good with this because he was experiencing these things. And I was like, I think I'll come out now. And he was just like, I know you want to, but can you just entertain my perspective that your body might not be telling you the truth right now? And you could try another contraction. I was like, look, man, like I feel like my fucking hip flex is going to snap off. And he's like, yeah, I get it. But just, I'll let you out, but just entertain. I was like, all right, like for whatever reason on that day, I was like, okay, I'll just see if I can contract again. And I contracted and I relaxed, which is part of the method. And I sunk a good, it like experientially, it felt like I sunk half a foot. In reality, it was probably like this much. Yeah. It's like I had felt a second before, like nothing was possible. There was no extra range. And so I sunk an extra inch. And not only did I sink the inch, but the whole experience of panic and alarm disappeared and it was actually relaxed. I was like, whoa, that's interesting. And like you get out of it and there's like a bit of euphoria and weirdness. And it's like, yeah, that's interesting. And Kit was smiling at me and it's like, yeah, I walked down. But then later I interpreted it as like, if you can have that experience in one muscle where you feel to God, like there's no extra range and then you go past that and the, yeah. the whole experience changes, possibly that would occur in other parts of your body. And so I just went, I went into it and I dived into stretching. That was the first point where I really got that there was something more to this stretching than just kind of becoming flexible. Okay, let me jump in here. Let me jump in here. So we'll come back to the kind of more than stretching, stretching. You know, we're going to definitely going to come back to that because it seems like one of your main themes. And I kind of want to start at the beginning here. Like, first of all, you're our first guest from Australia. So welcome. We've been pretty multinational on the show. And, um, the, we have a lot of American listeners that might not be able to get that from the accent. They sometimes confuse English and Australian accents, I've been told. <laughs> so I just want to point that out. You're on the other side of the world right now. It's totally weird. It's early in the morning in the UK and late in the evening in Sydney, right? Thank you. And um, Australia has this very physical culture. I have a bit of family there, never been there. They tell me it's a very physical culture. And for example, if you look at the Olympic results, um, there's a yep. direct correlation in every country in the world between population size. If you map population size for gross domestic product, there's a very clear line that every country in the world falls on in terms of Olympic medals, with the one exception of Australia, because it mm-hmm. seems like there's something going on there, potentially from the genetic heritage, you know, potentially from the kind of strong body culture uh, that's there. So f- first of all, I want to ask you about that, that like, as I understand it, Australia has this strong sort of competitive sports and a body beautiful kind of beach culture as well. Um, is that the kind of context you were kind of growing up in? Is, or have I been misinformed? No, no, that's like Australia has that for sure. It's, it's very sport dominant and a little bit what I had. Mm. Like as you grow up, you get the sportive thing. I played sports and it was 
a very, very big part of the heritage here. It's, it's wide. Like in the UK, you, you like sports, but you have... You guys really one, like sports. One grade, <laughs> one grade of football, we have yeah, four yeah. grades of football and everything okay. else. Like everyone does sport. There's a very big push for it. The whole physical education system is based around sport for good and for ill. Um, the sportive element, the fitness element is dialed these days, the whole calisthenics and all the other functional fitness and on from there movement is big, like along the Eastern seaboard, along the Western seaboard. We like to work out. We like to go to the beach. It's, it, it is a thing here in Australia, uh, for sure. And there's lots and lots of, when I was at the stage, like there's lots of martial arts here, very good ones, like very good different types mm. all over the place, very good types of uh, yoga and body work. It's quite a, yeah, it has a very large smorgasbord of, of physical training options available. Um, part of what happened later is I went through a lot of them. I went through martial arts. I went through stretching kind of like yoga. I went through body work and none of them really satisfied. And so I had to reconfigure things like the tools, the tools that are yep. used, the actual exercises are really good, but the whole framework didn't, didn't compute for me into what I wanted to do. And so that took a bit of working, but the whole, the culture of Australia is very, very sportive as you've run. Yeah, I'm curious because I'm going there for the first time next, uh, next, this summer when I'm, where your winter, when I'm on sabbatical. And so I'm just genuinely curious as much as anything, because you guys are kind of out there. It takes, you know, a long time to get there. I can jump on an easy jet flight to Holland. It takes me less than an hour in the air. You know, that's what I'm doing at the weekend. I'm teaching in Holland. And it's, it's like, to get there, it's going to take like 24 hours or something. And on the one hand, you guys speak English and there's a shared cultural heritage. But on the other hand, like you might have a cousin from there like I do or meet a guy who works in a bar in London. That's the sort of stereotype. But it's not a place mo most people go from Europe or the States, I think, generally. Maybe a backpacking thing, you know, when they're young. Um, mm. So I'm curious then, I've heard about a lot of steroid use, for example, that being super common as an aesthetic thing uh, in Oz. I used to work in a gym. Yeah. Uh, like a, a normal fitness gym it was reasonably common there it's probably increased yeah. I'm, I'm not in the gym scene anymore i wouldn't be surprised if that's correct information yeah and, and but the other thing i've come across is a lot of really good sports science from australia like i've, I've come across yeah. you know stuff i was looking at on studies on stretching as we'll get into like I've, it seems like you guys as are, are, because of this kind of even if it's a limited perspective on, you know, competitive sports, that there's developed a certain kind of rigor and interest and science around kind of things like stretching and strength training. Yeah, yeah, they have for a long time. Even in the 90s, which was a long time ago, the, the AIS, the Australian Institute of Sport, has been big in researching for a long time. And there's pathways to universities and all of that. And a lot of people do those qualifications. Like there, there has been... Because of the sporting interest, a lot of interest in training methods, and I, I was, I am still interested in them. But I was much, much more fascinated with them before I even went into the AAS library. They've got a, they used to have a library of books. I'm not sure if it's still there. Very uh, kind of costly and difficult to get yeah. books that you can and read. So, yeah, we, we like, we like the training side of things as well as the sportive side of things, and it seems to be quite well funded uh governmentally and otherwise so it's grown like it's grown and also you're there. right you're right next to asia right so there's all these kind of like asian uh immigrant influence and there's strong connections to bali and japan and china like that's actually more your corner of the world than than the uk in many ways right just in terms of sort of ease of access so i'm, I'm not surprised to hear there's quite a lot of kind of martial arts and things like that there no it's a it's a strange thing like some of australia doesn't tries to not think about that side of things, but we're right at the bottom of Asia and Asia is very close. We can get to Bali in a few hours and there are a lot of Asian people here. My wife is of Vietnamese descent, so mm. there's a lot of Asian people here. And being interested in martial arts, there have always been a lot of Asian martial arts in Australia. Um, it's just how it is. Like it's, it was cool. It was cool in that they were on offer. Like you could, you could read about them, but then you look and there's actually people who've gone and studied them in Canberra particular, for some reason, probably the large disposable income and people wanting to do stuff. A lot of people would go and study through Asia on holidays or for whatever period of time. And 
they would bring it back and teach. Well, that's the other thing is Australians travel, do they? Because you're sort of so far from anywhere, it's like it's normal for young Australians to go abroad, right? Like that's a normal yeah. thing to go to the UK or to go study somewhere or in the same way as not all countries have that culture of, of kind of going places and then bringing stuff back in, in the same way. So. Yeah. Uh, most of my friends did a gap year. I never did one because I was studying various things. But yeah, you're correct about that. Yeah. So a gap year, for those who don't know, listening in other countries is where you take a year off between studies, normally usually before or after university, and you take a year and you might, English people might go to Australia and pick fruit and Australians might come to England and the stereotype <laughs> is that working in a bar. So it's uh, it's a kind of Anglo-Australian type concept. Okay. So I also heard in your story something which we hear a lot on the podcast, like people enter in through, and you almost apologetic for it, like, you know, they want to learn to fight. Or in yoga, it might be they want to look good. You know, there's an aesthetic kind of um, drive there, or it's some sort of very practical thing. And then what happens is when you go into any art deep enough, it opens up, right? And you go, hang on a minute. I was just stretching because I wanted to do a higher kick. And now it's this fucking transformative experience. And I'm realizing there's a hell of a lot more to it. Yeah. So this happened to me. It happened at the same time as well. So I'd done roughly seven years of martial arts training. There's a little bit of crossover with the stretching. And then I got post-viral chronic fatigue syndrome and I couldn't do any martial arts or strength mm. training. It happened very suddenly. And so suddenly one day I was training somewhere between seven and 10 times a week, all this stuff. And then... I couldn't do any training for wow. um, almost a year. And it was, in retrospect, one of the best things that could have ever happened to me. But at the time, it was not viewed in such a light. But I'm here now, and it was what I needed to get, get some other perspective into my mm. life. I, mean, I, th- I think people often start, and we might say, a gross level, and then often a forced into looking at a more subtle level. I had a year and a half of injuries and in that year and a half, it's similar story from doing martial arts. I was really frustrated and I had all this energy because I was used to training. And then I started looking into healing arts and massage and herbs and because, you know, A, I needed to because I was injured, but B, I had all this kind of energy that I, you know, was used to using or it's like, well, I can't jump around, so I might as well sit and meditate. Do you know what I mean? And, and push my edge that way and go into the mental side of it, you know? And uh, so I think that's fairly common that people get forced almost into into the subtle side of it. Now, it definitely required a forcing for me. I was mm. not at all open to that. I, mean, I was studying biology and ecology and did not care for that stuff and liked martial arts and strength training. Yeah. And it's not like there was there's not there's benefits to the things I was studying but it was completely lopsided. Yeah. Not just lopsided in a like informational sense, but the whole hat you put on is completely different experientially to live in those realms. And so I did the, I went and studied soft tissue therapy as I was doing stretching, as I recovered from healing and I looked into everything to get better. And it took about five years to fully recover. And I got over that. But after that as well, I had to detox from that, that whole thing, the whole heresy of, of the first cycle was also a problem and I got to a place where also the healing arts and all those things, they weren't, they weren't satisfying me. They couldn't get to this, this underlying, what mm. I call disenchantment. They, they couldn't, they would only get there by accident, like the martial arts would. And so yeah. I made a bold decision to, to do something different. And so, I didn't regret it. Let's talk about disenchantment then. So I was looking at your site and I've, I've heard this term used in a few ways around kind of western culture i I may be misunderstanding it so what do you mean by this term disenchantment it's used a lot so it's used a lot and it's used very differently and that's one of the problems in that you can use the same word it's a bit like embodiment you talk to five (laughs) opinions about what that means so a lot of what i do i have to prefix was like this is what it means within physical alchemy so I, I was looking a little bit as similar to, I had a, a thing when I was very young, like before any of this stuff happened, I was just like very young, like five, six, eight type of age. You should look at the adult people and like my parents and other people and they, they'd come home and they're obviously unhappy with what they're doing. And you're yeah. like, why do you do this? And they're like, oh, like, I like it. I'm happy. And it's like, and you would like occasionally I'd ask them, I was like, but you don't look happy. And they're like, 
flat deny, like mm. yeah, and not just unhappy, right? Like sort of half dead, like not yeah, not, like, fully not alive. even there. Like it's just like, what are we doing? And so I was still liking life at that stage very much when I was young, and I was just like, why do these adults do these things? Like, and then you look at like what they're doing is like, why do people actually do these mm. things? All of those things, and then you get shut down enough times, and it goes away, and then you enter adolescence, and it's that cliched kind of like uh, high school, all of that thing. And then, but it was still in there. I was still like, so a few, I can't remember much of high school, seriously. Like at the time I was just like, why am I learning this stuff? And now still I'm like, I don't actually remember any of that stuff. So it obviously wasn't too important. I didn't, I didn't have enough interest as well. I didn't have enough power to actually draw me into study it. Whereas later I, I used to read almost nothing. And then when I was sick, I read 70 nonfiction books a year. Yeah. I wanted to look into it, but <clears throat> I was there, I was sitting there and for some reason, brave new world got studied in our English class. Mm-hmm. And that one I read like, fuck yeah. Like this guy knows what's happening. Like out of sucks. Yeah. Like, Aldous he was, was well ahead of his time. And I, and I think was, I saw a comparison of 1984 versus brave new world, which like standard, English texts at kind of high school or GCSE in England and many countries. And, and I you know, think Huxley really had it in terms of how people are seduced in terms of, you know, some of the specifics are a little, little, little weird, but in terms of the, the basic sense of how people are seduced and disassociated from their reality through distraction, it's, it was spot on. So I got that and I can't really, that was the only English text I ever really remember reading. And then in whatever year it was, year 10 or something, Fight Club came out the movie and mm. we watched it underage and it was like that one i look at it now and it's it's a bit nostalgic and there's things i don't agree with but still at the time like some of the stuff in that for a 15 to 18 year old person who doesn't know what they're doing it's you know like, it's, it's funny because people i've seen people that think that's an action movie and um or think it's about fighting you know and, yeah. and I particularly i know if i'm going to be honest a lot of women i know just don't get it and, I, and now it's used as a sort of uh, on men's courses and it's a sort of, I hear it quoted so many times, the red pill and, you know, the, uh, what, you know, consumerism, uh, buying, buying, you know, using time we don't have, buying shit we don't need to impress people we don't know. And the, it's really about consumerism and being a man disconnected from his physicality in a kind of disconnected modern world, right? And I, like, I, you know, I remember going to see it and was just blown away and I watched it 10 times. And the person I went to see it with was just like, I didn't get it, it was about scrapping. And it feels like some people just really get that movie on a deep level. And it's, uh, you know, I read the book a few times and a lot of other books by the author, Chuck Palo, Unpronounceable. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's a profound book that's really influenced the whole generation, particularly of young men, hasn't it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I watch it now and there's certain things about it that I disagree with. But at the time, it was perfect for, mm. for what I needed. Same with the, the martial arts. It was perfect. It built up like a lot of the things that I do now that I can digest now. There's no way I could digest that shit back in that era. I had to mm. actually build up some type of resources. I had no actual resources, like just floating along like... Mm. But that's the thing. That's the thing about this enchantment. There's these people just floating along and you can just go. Like sometimes they even agree with you. Like, what are you doing with your life? Like, do you want to do this? Like, oh, not really. It's like, and they even sometimes, like, yeah, I don't want to do this. And then like 10 years later, they're still, <laughs> they're still doing it, right? There's no yeah. actual resources to change. Yeah. And so a lot of my stuff, and when I was doing body work, the most influential stuff was actually, I never studied it officially, but reading Ida Rolf, mm-hmm. her stuff. Like, it was just like, fuck, she was onto something. And she reading like i i got to a point actually when i read too much and it was becoming a problem and i i set myself a challenge of just rereading in a cycle my nine most favorite books nice. over and over and it really sparked something particularly reading Ida Rolf the third or fourth time it's just like actually i have these skills that happen to be stretching from the apprenticeship i've done and and some strength training but if I take them into this perspective of trying to build resources and break down patterns of mm-hmm. like habit in people, that is something different. Like that's the different framework. A lot of her work was like, it was ancient. Like I don't even know what year it is in the fucking forties or something. Yeah. Yeah. But pretty old school. Yeah. She, like, and she studied like proper tantric Hatha yoga in the twenties in Brooklyn. And she had a very incredible life. People always go, Oh, she did a PhD in, 
whatever molecular chemistry or something like that, which is impressive for, for a female of that era. But she did all this other cool stuff. And there's all these quotes in her work that where she just developed the method from intuition. And then she's like, ah, oh, I developed the theories later. It's like, well, yeah, I, like, I feel like there if was... you can dive into that, like you can get somewhere. There was, there was Alexander, one of your guys from Tasmania yeah. and Moshe Feldenkrais and Rolf and they were kind of intuitively kind of coming up with things that later became the field of somatics and embodiment. And if you look back, like most decent teachers from the generation maybe before ours were trained by one of those three or, you know, some sort of lineage around those three. Like we've had, um, we had uh, Don Hannon Johnson on who was trained by Ida Rolf. We've had someone on that's trained by Feldenkrais, you know, Alexander people, Bruce Furtman's coming on who's trained by him. So it's, 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 it's like they, they were the kind of grandparents of it, but it's been, it seems to have been like they were kind of accidentally stumbling on, hey, if you're working physically, you're also working mentally, emotionally, psychologically, even politically. Mm-hmm. And that feels like that's become better articulated now. And people have got, rather than that just happening and accidentally, or, you know, you're doing a stretch and all of a sudden it's like, fucking hell, you have this big opening. It feels like that's getting better articulated now. Um, maybe we could come back to stretching then and really let's just start with the absolute basics here, because I know the average martial artist thinks stretching is just sort of bouncing up and down on your muscles to make them longer. And yeah. that was my version of stretching. I go to a lot of yoga classes and that it's almost just like this meat, you pull on the meat, the meat gets longer. Like that is the basic view <laughs> of stretch. And you're laughing, right? Cause you're so far beyond that. But I want to start there because until fairly recently, that was my point of view too. You know, like you do your kind of average martial arts warm up is just, horrible from a sports science point of view and um yeah so what is stretching to you now if it's um, my sense is you've gone way beyond that perspective yeah so i don't i don't entertain the sports science perspective overly anymore either though it is better than the martial artists so when you talk about stretching people normally quite accurately go well that's about flexibility yeah like that's the primary use of flexibility training within the the west and also probably the East it's used to increase flexibility. It makes sense. Like <clears throat> that's why a lot of people sign up. They want to, they want to get more rate of motion. So that's a, that's a quantitative capacity. Like you have more degrees of <clears throat> range within whatever motion it is for the posture. It looks more impressive. You can do more activities. All of those things are involved in that. So stretching is when you work with the stretch reflex if you take it back right to basics and I have to, like a lot of people who come to me, they don't know all the other stuff I do and they just want to stretch and it's fine because you can help people with that as well. But if you take it right back to that level, you're working with the stretch reflex and you're trying to go beyond what the maps of the body has. As can you say what the stretch are. reflex is? Let's really go back to basics here. Yeah, the stretch reflex is a property of the muscle spindles that prevents the body from going into a range it doesn't have a map of as an injury protective mechanism. So there's a, there's a part, there's, there's a, a biological part called a spindle in your muscles, and when you get to a certain point, it goes, hang on, enough, you're going to get injured if, if you go yeah. further than that. So you understand it. Like if you, take a, if you take your arm far enough back or any body part mm-hmm. into a limb range that you don't normally go into, you get a stretch. Everyone has felt a stretching sensation. Like that's a very basic thing. Everyone has felt that somehow it might not have been good. It might have been injurious, but it, it, they felt a stretching sensation as in they're running up against where their body does not normally go. They don't have a motor pattern there. They don't, they sometimes have contective tissue armoring around that area as well. They, they cannot go any further. You break it down into very simple things. Like people like to get really complex with this, but you don't have to. Yeah. You can't go any further. You don't have a pattern like how you got there is a whole other story. If you if you take kids and they're not trained into bad motor yeah. patterns, they don't need any stretching because they have the range of motion. Like my daughter doesn't need stretching because she's perfectly flexible. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's interesting, isn't it? That kids have great flexibility, and I'm, I've noticed I've been working with kids for twenty years, and in that time, I've seen kids uh, lose their flexibility younger. Is I've, yeah. def- I've definitely noticed that. that. Like the average ten year old can't touch their toes now, and it used to be the yeah. average sixteen year old. You know, so it's like this definite change. But as you say, we start off pretty flexible. And the sort of most simple model is this meat like pulley system and you pull it to make it longer. 
And then a more sophisticated model is actually there's this stretch reflex, which is about feeling. And, you know, we, we kind of tighten up at a certain point. And, you know, like this is, we had like talking about Feldenkrais, for example, actually feeling what's going on and realizing that that's okay and not going into that fight flight response and then relaxing and realizing you can go. That's when stretching maybe becomes a bit more interesting, say in a yoga class where it's like, okay, I'm on a psychological and emotional edge here. And am I actually going to be able to breathe and relax? Because we go into that kind of contraction when we hit that, we hit that edge, right? So what's, yeah. what's your understanding of, of stretching now? So I utilize those a lot. This is where the, the, the living end is, so to speak. That's the actual working part. And people uh, are, are generally grouped into two categories uh, along a spectrum. And either they uh, try to kind of destroy their organism with stretching. They try too hard to just thrash it to get more flexible. Or mm. they're pretty much allergic to feeling anything inside their body and don't go anywhere near the actual realm. So I've... I've got a few things that I use to draw this. There's particular graphs, like, but either end of the spectrum is wrong. You need to get into the zone where it is enough stimulus to provoke adaptation yeah. in the connective tissues and everything else, neurological and everything. Enough stimulus not to harm, but to increase not only range of motion, but increased sensory motor intelligence you want to reduce the amount of sensory motor amnesia in the in the person so can you explain i know that term means but can you explain it because there's some long words there sensory motor amnesia is Um, it basically means you have this body which is amazing and all these systems working uh connective tissues and other systems but you can't feel them yeah on an organ system and that not feeling is the limitation a lot of the time right and when people learn to feel that they, they can actually go much further than their range and they, they thought they could. So it's not about me elongating the meat longer. It's about learning to feel again. Uh, you, it's not exactly like that. You can thrash the okay. body past its limit pretty easily without feeling. And this is how you create people who are very flexible, but can't feel, right. which is not a really good equation in my books. I see that but in you can, a lot. You can, yeah, you can be flexible and also feel a lot. So, yes, it's a long word, but until we get a better one. No, no, it's good for me. I just want to make sure everyone's kind of out there. I think it's a beautiful term, the, f- the forgetting of the body. You know, it's a sort of scientific way of talking yeah. about disembodiment I really like. I've come across it in the uh, somatics uh, world. Um, okay, so, this, so you're really working here with personality as well. I mean, if you say, like, you know, some people don't want to feel the body, they don't want intensity, other people are sort of break, you know, pushing themselves to a point where they're, you know, breaking themselves down, no pain, no game, abusing themselves. And I, you know, I definitely, I was in a very strong vinyasa yoga class in London at the weekend. And it was just full of, I'm from Brighton, which is kind of like Byron Bay, chilled out kind of place. And I was up in London and I did a class with London people, you know, like hardcore in the city. And mm-hmm. people were just kicking their ass, their own asses. And uh, like, I was looking at it like shocked, you know, it was like being in some S and M club. It was really, uh, so I'm told, um, it was like, just like, just bizarre to look at the amount of sort of self abuse people were engaging with. And then there's the other end of the spectrum, which is like, you know what? I don't like pushing myself, you know, they call it sort of yin pathology. So it's, I mean, it sounds like you're working as much with personality and psychology and emotion as you are with just the physicality. Yeah, that's the aspect of my work I call re-enchantment work. It has Mm. to work with all the centers at once. If you want the human being to grow, you have to work with all three at once. And a lot of people have a very lopsided development. They've got one or two, often one, developed quite well, but the other is dormant or dead, hidden away. Yeah, They can hide it quite well if they're good at one, but you cannot get anywhere uh, interesting if you don't have all, all of them working and other things as well. So it's easy though. So what I do, I teach stretching and a lot of people will see this and they go, oh, like he learned that from Kit. It's like, yes, I did. Like I learned stretching from Kit, but it's gone into a different realm now. I use stretching because stretching is not just about increasing range of motion. Stretching is a very, very good tool for shining a light into the areas of the body that you don't want to look into. Okay. And that provokes other reactions in the person. And if you do it right, and if you keep it in the bracket that we want it to be, you can very easily and over time grow 
in more than just the physical sense. And so I use stretching because stretching is a very good vehicle for what I really teach, which is re-enchantment. And it still makes people flexible and a lot of people don't care about what I'm talking about now and they still want to, they just want to become flexible. And that's once again, re-enchantment in one sentence means... You can't do it in one sentence, man. <laughs> it's a very, very difficult thing. So it'll just like disenchantment. Disenchantment means a lot of things to a lot of people. Yeah. There's a lot of yeah. books. There's at least five books called The Reenchantment of the World. A lot of them center around the Industrial Revolution, Scientific Revolution, split from sacred and secular, all of the things involved with that, which is part of what I would say is the general disenchantment, the disembodiment of the Western populace mm-hmm. is also part of that. So anything that works with getting people back in the body is working on the general aspects. But from my research in the last few years, last seven years, I think there are very specific components to it that will block people from actually getting over it as the false, uh, false eye patterns start to coagulate in the wrong way on the stuff that they are using to get themselves further. And this is actually what I do most of the time with my work and when I'm teaching stretching. So so let's get really practical then, because it, you know, I know you're a kind of high level with this. I was looking at your website and there's some really kind of, you know, intellectual stuff on there. And I I also want to give anyone who's listening to this some really practical kind of things they can use. Because most people that are listening to this do some kind of stretching, right? They might be martial artists, dancers, yoga teachers. They might just be, I don't know, a psychotherapist who kind of stretches out on the carpet for 10 minutes when they get home after work because it feels good, you know? So, like, what are some tips to turn that physical stretching into an in, in ch- more, as you might say, enchanting or, you know, a more uh, rich experience for people? Sure. Like this is pretty easy to do. This is what I do with people over time. And a lot of the things you need to understand is this stuff takes time. People, people like to think that they can do this stuff quickly, but it's a, it's, it's the whole thing is like the old school Taoist timelines. We're talking about years and decades, not really about days and weeks here, which is a Western thing. But like I said, like there's a lot of these polarities that exist within stretching. People want to thrash themselves. Those people need to learn to, Slow down the feel, it's pretty easy. They need to train less. So the method I teach, you can easily make gains in both range of motion and sensation from once every fortnight or once every week. But people want more. Like, can I train three days a week? Well, you can, but for you personally, it might be counterintuitive. Like same with the people who are on the other end of the spectrum, the people who very much are fearful of the body and apprehensive of going in, like what happens if I get hurt? It's like well, we don't actually want you to get hurt, like, but maybe this stretch, this range, this day, you're feeling good. Maybe instead of doing three breaths in there, we could do four. Like, I'll be here. Like, I'll support the, the balance component of it. We'll have all the props set up. Maybe you could do four. Eh? And it's never a forcive process. For me, I never force people to do what they don't want to do. It's always selective. Yeah. But people can be coaxed that extra tiny percent, like that's a large part of what the teacher does in these classes is you sit there as a catalyst. Yeah. You get people that extra bit they would never do by themselves. But over time, that extra little bit makes such a big difference. Yeah. And I, I did this, I teach yoga teachers, something called embodied yoga principles. And I mean, the difficult thing teaching yoga is that half the class need to do less and half the class need to do more. And so it's like encouraging people, isn't it? To be like, you know, you might want to back off from this a little bit if you're the sort of person who tends to kind of abuse himself. Or you might want to push yourself a little bit more, hang out there for another breath. It's why I don't like yoga classes that do everything to account, you know, five breaths or five seconds or whatever it is. Because it's like, well, what does each person need? Does, you know, and what do I need today? You know, what I need after my dad died isn't what I need a Monday morning a year later. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's like, like that, that like how, you know, what's the quality I'm building within this process rather than just, right. We, the same thing works for everyone. Yeah. I do exactly the same thing. I mean, every single day is different. Part of what the lesson in the initial phase of my stretching is getting to know your, your your pattern like how you are in this stretch all of these things on a on a normal day and then if it's it's a super stressful week all these things happen you're going to be tighter like it's not going to work the same this is the aspect of having a human form to deal with you get collateral from everything everything is a stressor and it's read out on the body in some way 
it's not going to be the same. People don't like that. They want the nice quantitative linear mode, but we're a qualitative creature too. We can't just deal with that. And people will get injured because it says on this piece of paper, I need to do this this week. But yeah, my dad died and I slept three hours last night and I've had 17 coffees today and blah, 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 blah. Sure. It's not going to work. Like it's not going to work. So also it's, it's more disenchanting, isn't it? Because if I'm following, say, a physio or, a, you know, it's giving me a piece of paper with it on or a yoga teacher, I'm not actually tuning into myself. So that stretching becomes a disenchantment process rather than a re-enchantment process. Yeah, it's very difficult to make anything a re-enchantment process. Stretching is very easily disenchanted in exactly the ways you're talking about and other yep. ways. Same with every type of training, same with martial arts, same with strength training, same with any training. Like The, the pattern is to disenchant it as quickly as possible. That's how it reacts. It becomes a habit. It becomes distracted. You stop paying attention to it and it becomes another thing you do. Or it becomes a competition. It becomes another goal setting thing. It becomes a thing. I have to make this goal by this day. It's like, so, so give me some more tips then. Like what I'm going to a yoga class at lunchtime. The teacher's pretty considerate. You know, it's a good class. Like what are some ways that are going to give me some other things that can help me? You know, I get that it's a long-term process and give a few pointers there. Well, like, I don't know how everyone teaches yoga classes. When I teach people, if, if I see them, so I get a lot of people of different standards in my class, which is fine. If you teach on patterns, you can teach anyone. Like someone comes in with the splits, someone has back pain, someone, it's all fine. You're stretching the hip flexors here. You're stretching the hamstrings here. You're stretching this posture here. It's no big deal. You have to go around and spend time with every single person in the class. Like, because you just standing there will let them get that little extra bit they need or you see they really want to push and it's your job to actually stop them. Like come out now. Like that's what you have to do. That's why I'm never up on the stage teaching a posture. I always go around instructing and queuing. Like you teach a lesson and you go around. I was in a yoga class in London this weekend as well that had 50 people in. And I just thought how could, and there's actually in two separate rooms. You know, the teacher was sort of walking between the two rooms and I, I was kind of like, how can that be safe? You know, like, like, like I like small classes and I, there's an economic push obviously there where the teacher yes. can actually come up to you and they know you and there's a relationship and they can be like, Mark, it looks like you're pushing a bit hard again. Now might be the time to, to back off kind of thing. So that, that relationship and knowing the students is important too, right? No, for sure. Like I don't do what I do for getting 50 people in my class i won't teach that many i can't teach that many i'm i'm good at what i do but it's just impossible if i had 50 people to teach i'd have to bring half my advanced students in as assistant teachers yeah couldn't get the quality you can't get the quality actually do what i do with that numbers it's impossible it's not actually feasible to do that in terms of like not economic feasibility but quality you cannot get that person to experience what i'm talking about with my method with that smaller odds it's just impossible and it's a physical transmission you as a teacher have embodied your training method yeah you have to actually pass it on person to person to your students you can't yeah. do that with people unless you have a whole week for me it's like there's a long-term relationship i'm going to gary carter's class at lunch he was actually one of the first guests on the podcast and i've known him for 10 years i've been to his wedding do you know what i mean he has dinner yeah. with me and my wife you know it's like he knows my body intimately you know, and it, that without that kind of relate, and he knows my emotions. He knows that I tend to push it too hard, and I get distracted. And do you know what I mean? It's like he knows what jokes I like. He knows what metaphors are going to work for me. You know, it's 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 it's, it's that's the kind of relationship which I, I find um, most nourishing for any activity. You know, my keto teachers I've known for fifteen years. You know, the current ones. Um, so you've got a couple of, I'm not sure if they're brands or systems. So this physical al- alchemy and this, and this physical yeah. repatterning and the physical alchemy has got this super cool logo and I'll link to it for people on the, uh, yeah. on the sites. They can look at that. And I, I know you recently, you sort of sent me a logo to, uh, sorry, a visual to look at, or is it Cerberus? Yeah. So it seems yeah. like you're into like cool logos. So can you say something about both those terms, physical repatterning and physical alchemy and, and these cool visuals that you've been working with? I can. So the whole method itself is called physical alchemy. That's the, that's the wide, sorry, wide kind of overarching thing. Within that, there's, there's a different, different concentric circles, depending on not just what we're teaching, but the person who come, comes to the method. 
I don't hold people back who can go into more advanced stuff, but I don't let people in who can't. It's fair. Yep. If you can have, you can handle it. So physical repatterning work is, I don't want to use the word, but it's a paradigm. It's a way to use physical training of any type. It just happens to be stretching when I teach, but some of my other colleagues will use more Taoist physical cultivation methods or strength training. But the whole context is different from fitness, is different from therapy, is different from aesthetics. The goal is to destroy habitual passions within the person and build resources in a way that is coherent within the method. And that is the outer shell. That is what people who come to classes will work with. It's not really any one method. Like I don't, it could be taught with anything physical, any type of physical training. It's a way of teaching physical methods that lends itself more percentage wise, even though I hate percentage wise, it lends itself more likely to create a result that both simultaneously gives the physical benefits of the method that's being taught, but also has a better chance of inroading into the, the person as a, as a total. Okay. This is very cool. So I want to slow this down a little bit. So what we see is there's all these physical methods and sometimes they like accidentally lead to personal change, like with stretching and you have this big transformation or you're doing martial arts and you get injured, you have this big transformation. And what I've seen is that that's fairly inefficient generally as a process. And again, you know, modernist paradigm efficiency, but it certainly uh, can be done better. If our goal is transformation, our goal is personal growth rather than just the physical method, you know, to kick hard or to dance beautifully or whatever. And then this sounds like this is a set of principles, a paradigm, which can, as, a, as I understood it, is applied to different things to, to help improve that aspect or enhance that aspect of things. Yes, that aspect is primary. The other aspects that are normally focused on are secondary, not yeah. unimportant, of course, but the aspect of transformation is primary. But I was also looking at it and I was not satisfied with it being haphazard. And so I looked at ways of making it not haphazard and I found mm -hmm. them in a very interesting set of circumstances. And I like it's not <clears throat> research as people would normally see it, but I definitely research in a way that has a method to it. And I get, I've gotten some extremely interesting results of the last few years and it's led my research down avenues I could not I have imagined a while ago, but I let it go there. This is the aspect of this type of research is once the work kind of catches a light and becomes a living work, follow it. So give me some sp specifics here. Like what are some of the things I know, you know, this is your life's work. So it's a big subject, but what are mm -hmm. some of the things that really help uh, in focusing on the transformative in a physical art rather than, you know, other than just saying, okay, that's our focus and goal, which is a big one to begin, you know, we're yeah. not just kicking or stretching. Like what are some of the other things in your system that really help? Cause that, that is what I think everyone that listens to this podcast is interested in. Yeah. So the, one of the biggest things I could emphasize is that I love strength training. I love martial arts. I love all those explosive power things. They're very cool. If you take them into the realm of, uh, like fear, exposing fears that can be very, very potent. I don't particularly do so martial arts. I don't do teaching of that in terms of sparring, which can definitely work with fear. Or if you teach parkour or things like that, working with heights, that can definitely work with fear. That is a transformative aspect. I work with increasing sensory impressions of the body, which is another aspect that is very transformational. If you can increase the aspect of your physical structure let's just keep it physical that you are aware of as in keenly aware of it's cool like for instance like just for starters like you have this body like why the fuck can't you feel all these things in it like is this very interesting point i considered at length like all the muscles but can you feel your liver can you feel your digestive system all these things are in there you know that because you're sitting there and you're alive. Like if you look at the anatomy textbooks, you've got all these organs, but where are they? Like, why can't I feel them? I found that a very interesting point. You start to work with things, various types of inhibited properties of adhesions and trigger points and all these other phenomena. I view them, they're viewed normally in a pain science module, whereas I view them as an awareness dampening module. So if you press on a trigger point, you get like a referral line sometimes that's viewed as 
pain, referring, interfering with motor function. But I also mainly, there's a few lines in Travell and Simon's books that I found very interesting where they say it doesn't just dampen the motor function, but it dampens the sensory functioning. So you cannot actually feel these lines that have been blocked by all these uh, various adhesions and trigger points within the body. So I will work on those with stretching and other methods, not because I want pain removed. I don't want pain mm. if I can, but I want to enhance the sensory clarity of the physical body because it lends itself not just to the more advanced training, but if you, if you have a very high body intelligence in terms of breathing apparatus and very high tension pattern reading of the body, when you get in situations in your life circumstance that you don't like, you can start to unplug them via seeing how tension enters the physical body. Yeah. You get in an argument, like, where do you feel that argument? You get in a whatever other circumstance emotionally, like, how does that actually manifest physically and can you override that and stop it? Yeah, so I'm in the car with my sister the other day. She starts arguing with me about uh, our dad's will. And I notice that there's, you know, my head comes forward, my belly contracts, and I just go, hang on a minute. You might want to yeah. inhibit this before you shout back and your knee starts crying, you know, like, and having sure. the kind of A, the body awareness to notice that and, and B, uh, kind of like enough kind of sensory motor kind of skill to go, right, let's put something else in its place that right now might be more helpful than going into a fight flight response while sitting in a chair talking to your grief ridden sister, you know? Like that's what you're talking about, right? For sure. And it, it's like, that's a very, very good example of a, that's a difficult situation. Like when you're, when you're really plugged in to, to stop it, but just subtle things like just irritation is just like a subclinical anger running through the body and you can just stop it if you're inclined to, or you can just let it go and run your life. Like same nice. with anxiety, same with all these things. Like you, where do you feel depression? Where do you feel anxiety? Can you feel your organ sheaths tense up when you have those things? Like if you yeah. can't, like it's going to be difficult for you to unplug that. Yeah, yeah, that's a sort of you have to notice something before you can change it. It's a basic Feldenkrais, and I did an episode on what I call centering. I've got an ebook on that, which kind of relates to a lot of this stuff. Um, before, sort of, we need to start moving towards wrap up now, just because of time. Okay, uh, you want to talk about these cool diagrams of yours a little bit? Like, like I'm really <laughs> curious about the physical alchemy one, and people can hopefully this will make people kind of Google your site as well to have a look at it. But I'm, you know, I'm genuinely curious about that. And then there's this three-headed dog dude that you sent me as well, and I'm, I'm kind of like. You I have to ask about that or else I'm going to be curious for the rest of the day. Okay, so the, the logo itself is fun and cool and has various meanings to it. Um, I'll put that aside for a second. The dog itself is the first of what I call the re-enchantment diagrams. I, ha I use diagrams a lot. They're symbolic representations of a lot of information. So if you read a lot of information, it's, it's all good, well and good, but you've got to have an actual way to easily practically access it like it's fine to know all these things but i actually am interested in people changing not in knowing lots of things so this particular diagram was the fruit of a very long process for me so i looked into all these things i call disenchantment in terms of what uh in the west the books talk about and a lot of it was general and it's not that that's stuff i don't uh agree with it's mm. just that what I saw was there were some very, very specific patterns within people and they're very, very tricky and they hide under the surface. So I had to give something that gave a gist, but then again, it's still difficult because people will look at that diagram and there's halos around the heads of the dogs and I'll go, oh, I do like one from all of these things. Like, no, no, like people have one of these blocks. You can do any type of behavior. What I'm trying to get at is the actual disenchantment is a thing underneath words and you have to have quite a high body awareness to feel how you react in these things. But there's a very specific aspect to disenchantment that hits people. Mm. Disenchantment is largely education of a, in a negative sense. It's the, the habits you've been educated in since you were born that coagulate in a certain way and form a lens that you've, uh, you view reality through on top of all the other lenses you have, which are many. But this is what I will call a mesodermal lens. Just as Rolf talked about the muscles and fascia as being mesodermal in the physical body, 
This is mesodermal on a different level, mesodermal in what I say call a cultural body level. This is my interpretation, and also I took it from Gurdjieff, obviously, as I wrote in the article. He would call it a certain thing, but what I took from all my research into disenchantment and then reading on him was that what he had described was actually a specific mechanism for how disenchantment coagulates in a human being post childhood. And it actually comes in earlier these days, as you said, with movement patterns. These patterns are also, also coming earlier. But the most interesting aspect of this is that it's educated. Like it means that it's not actually really part of you. Like you, you will, if you can feel this thing in you, it will feel very homely and like it's you which is deceptive, but if you get it out of you, uh, it will be a whole new world for you, but not many people get it out of them. It, it, it has an intelligence of its own, this coagulation, and it tries to, to reestablish itself, and that's why not many people have succeeded in getting it out. I'm very interested in anyone of any modality who has gotten it out of themselves, and I've met a few outside of what I teach, and those people are very interesting human beings. What it is in terms of grand total theory is it's the creative resources that you would have had if you weren't educated properly coagulate along a certain line and then skewer how you view everything. But it's just a partial coagulation or it's a, it's a temporary coagulation. It can be resolved. It's difficult, but you can unblock it and your perspectives upon life afterwards the creativity that you can bring into your life if you if you make this block dissolve is, I don't know what to say about it. It's quite remarkable. And so this is my, like you said, this is my life work. I'm 34 years old now and I have done this with five people, including myself. And all I really want to do is do this with hundreds of people because it's such a remarkable process. Yes, I use stretching as one of the primary yeah. Mechanism, but it's not stretching. I could do this with no stretching. I could do this with just. Yeah. Perfect. You need a way yeah. in, though, right? You need a way in to anything kind of like this, you know, whether that's martial arts or stretching or whatever. Yeah, for sure. And you may as well be flexible or good at martial arts as you go along in these processes. Like I love all this, all the outer shell stuff too. Being good at martial arts, being good at all these things is a wonderful thing. And all the like, like this is the difference. Like this is what I call reenchantment. Well, it's not to do with health or healing or physical rehabilitation, all of which are beautiful and amazing things of which it direly needed. But this is a completely different thing. So this is what I chose. I went through all those arts and part of them fitted, but then part of them didn't. And then I finally came to a point where it's this, like, this is what I want. This happened to me in isolation. I had lost contact with my uh, spiritual teacher for 18 months. And so I was in a chaotic period. And this, this thing happened to me, this transmutation happened to me and I didn't understand what had happened. And then I helped one of my very good friends who you saw before fixing up the audio through it. And once I'd got two, it became, wait a second, something's happening here. And then once I had got three, uh, the other member of physical alchemy, Fred, who's in Denmark, happened to him. Once I had three, it was, it was a very interesting thing. And then a few others happened. And yeah, it's this thing. My, my primary locus is to do this. So this is why I write the word re-enchanter. This is what I try to do with people is re-enchant people using primarily physical methods because this is the, the Petri dish I grew out of. Mm. But... You could do it with anything. I have people, you could do it with music. You could do it with art. You could do it with psychotherapy. You could do it with anything, like anything, like, as long as you do it. Like that's the primary, primary thing, as long as you do it. And there's certain signs and other things involved in this transmutation that I am in the very early infancy of looking into. But I'm sure there's people in the world hiding away who know much more than me. So it's not like, uh, I'm going to investigate my own methods in this, but I don't feel 
like it's a novel thing in a way. I feel like it's a very normal thing. I feel like it's a rediscovering of how humans are actually meant to be. Yeah, the, the, as, yeah, that, that, that's how I view embodiment. Or you know, there's a lot of crossover of reenchantment by the sounds of things. That it's not, it's not something weird and new. It's just a kind of like saying, look, this is actually our birthright. This is actually our, you know, how we are, how we are, and not fucked up. Listen, we're on time, so we need to wrap up. Um, in terms of finding you online, it's physicalalchemy.com.au, right? That'll get you there. I have a group which is if you just put physical alchemy into Facebook, yeah. it's quite a, like it's 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 active. That group is active, but those two links will get you communicare. You can PM me if you want. It's all cool. Like I'm just interested in people who are interested in this work. Can do it. I just clicked on your Instagram here and there's some of your colleagues here. There seems to be a really cool group of trainers who are doing interesting things. I might get some of the yeah. others on the show as well. As I said, ahead of going to Australia, I'm kind of trying to learn more about ours and meet some cool people there. Uh, my, my sense is that you'd probably do well in a really long form. So I hope we can have a walk around Sydney for a few hours and, uh, have a really good chat and go. I'm curious to go into sort of way more depth than even an hour podcast can. So um, I'd love it's to sort of hang out with you for a few hours in Sydney when I'm there and sort of walk around the parks and uh, chat shit about the body. So, um, sir, any, any last message about the body before we wrap it up for all our listeners? Do something. Do something that you actually enjoy doing in terms of physical training. There's plenty of good stuff out there. Uh, get into it and also don't just focus on – uh, quantitative measurable things but try to feel into the body uh, the thing you live in thank Lots you very much <laughs> thank you sir thank you sir if you enjoyed this episode subscribe to get more if you'd like to help us build the embodied tribe leave a review on itunes or share this on your social media if you're interested in training globally sign up to receive the newsletter at embodiedfacilitator.com until next time welcome home to the body